Okay, uh, my name is Juan Hernando, and first of all, I would like to thank Eric and Sean, who is just not here, uh, for inviting me to, to be a speaker in this workshop. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here because I've learned a lot of things from uh, the presentations uh, beforehand. And I want to give a little bit of my background. Uh, I'm not a, a neuroscientist, as m uh, some of you already know. I obtained my degree in computer science from the uh, Technical University of Madrid in 2005. It was the old degree, so it could be uh, considered also as a master's in computer science. And I finished my PhD in visualization uh, last year from the same university. And since now, uh, since then, I've been working as a postdoc at the Supercomputer and Visualization Center of the uh, UPM within the Cajal uh, Blueprint Project and collaborating with the, with the Blueprint Project, which is a collaboration which I started back in, in 2006. My expertise is uh, in uh, visualization and computer graphics, and that involves C++, uh, OpenGL, libraries for uh, visualization, and also uh, combining C++ and Python and the convoluted things that can be done with that. So here's an outline of uh, what I want to present. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to present uh, uh, impressive uh, applications as the, the previous speakers were done because uh, pieces of software that I saw in the, in the previous talks were pretty amazing. I will talk about what we've been doing for the, in this Cajal Blue Brain, Blue Brain Project col collaboration, which basically refers to this application that we use for the visualization, which is called RTNeuron. Uh, and most of the talk will be on the challenges that uh, imply moving to multi-scale modeling and uh, a, a scenario in which this multi-scale modeling will be accomplished, which is the index of scale computing a scenario. And finally, I would talk a little bit about uh, software architecture that uh, we are starting to develop to, to more or less couple with the prototyping challenges, the, the, the prototyping that needs to be done to cope with these uh, challenges for, for visualization. So I want to start with something that doesn't have anything to do with neuroscience at all, but has to do with uh, visualization, which is this magnificent image uh, from uh, uh, French civil engineering that uh, was designed back in the, in the 19th century. And what it depicts is uh, the army of Napoleon from its travel to France, to Russia and back, and how it was uh, how the number of soldiers uh, dismissed from the, the 400,000 missile uh, number in the, in the army to the little that came back from, from Moscow, which is the, the black line. What you see here is a lot of information in a single image. You have the direction in which the army was going, the number of soldiers, uh, you also have the dates and the temperature in the, the curve uh, below of the they travel back to, to France and you can see uh, details like for example that in the crossing of the river which I can see the name from here which is in this corner mm, half of the army uh, couldn't pass so you can see that in a single image you can depict a lot of information if the, the visualization is well designed so how can help visualization in scientific discovery uh, Scientific discovery has moved to simulation-based research in, in all areas. Uh, it, it started first with uh, engineering and physics, and biology has come uh, the latest to, to the party, but it's pretty clear that um, a lot of biological research depends on, on simulations. So visualization can be a fundamental tool, first of all, for the bagging and, um, for the bagging and validation of, of a simulation. Then, what to me is the most important use case, but it's the less used most of the cases, is the, the discovery of new knowledge. And then, of course, the dissemination of scientific results, which this is what I call the 3Ds for visualization in, in scientific discovery. And since uh, we are moving into this uh, simulation based research area, the community from data management, analysis and visualization needs to col collaborate tightly co uh, coupled with the simulation communities in order to deliver the high quality tools that scientists need to actually comprehend the uh, huge data sets that are being generated nowadays. So, uh, 
I said that uh, scientific insight should be the primary goal of visualization, but instead most of the time it's been used as a debugging and a presentation tool. A scientific discovery relates to what it's called in the literature as visual analysis. So with visual analysis we, meant, <coughs> we, mean try, we try to mean that visualization is not, not only a rendering of pretty pictures, but you actually want to answer scientific questions. And in order to do that, you, you have to be able to configure and customize the visualization for the needs of the scientists. And different tasks have to be performed in order to uh, be able to transform a data set, an initial data set, into something that looks like a, a picture that can answer a question. And a recent taxonomy of tasks that was presented in uh, ACMQ uh, is this one. I removed two of them because I, I thought that weren't uh, so interesting as the rest. And they, it, this taxonomy has these three categories, uh, data view and specification, view manipulation, and process and provenance. And the most important, you could say, that are the ones on the top, the data and view specifications, which are visualize, filter, sort, and derive. By visualize, it's what we can understand as visualization in the, in the main sense, which is choose a visual encoding for the data set and render it. Then, if you actual, actually want to, to be able to understand a massive data set, you also have to be able to filter data to focus on the, the features that are of particular interest. Also sort the data in order to expose patterns that are not readily visible, uh, for example using clustering and things like that. And also derive additional values from the data like uh, statistics and uh, statistical analysis, things like that. Then in view manipulation, uh, that has to do with all that it's interactive uh, manipulation of the, of the data, like selecting the items that you, you want to operate in and navigate through the data. And that doesn't mean only to uh, navigate, do 3D navigation on a, on a 3D rendering, but also being able to choose between the different levels of detail that come from the data. And also coordinate the views uh, when you want to have different representations of the same data and do selections of subsets, to those selections be applied to, to, the, uh, to the different views that you, you have of the data, for example. And then in the last category, we have the annotation, which was already mentioned in, in, in the presentations before, sharing for collaborative uh, viewing, which uh, was also mentioned in, I don't remember the name, but it was uh, the presentation that's before me, uh, with this collaborative annotation tool and guiding users to the analysis process, which means, which means that sometimes uh, the visualization can be really complex and the data set uh, also, so it's not easy for, for a user to know where the interest features are. So if you can provide algorithms that are able to pre-select interesting or important features from the data set and show them directly to, to the user, that's also a, a, a good advantage. So going to this BBP Cajal Burbank collaboration, uh, what involves me has been mainly uh, developing tools and software architecture for the visualization of the detailed cortical column simulation so far. And, well, I'll say two software products, but uh, actually it's three. Uh, from this collaboration, uh, three software products have been produced. The first one is the one that I'm going to present here, which is Hearty Neuron, which is a C++ standalone application, which is an ad hoc renderer for the Hodgkin Hosky simulations. Uh, also, Spina, which is something that I won't talk about because I wasn't involved in the, in the development, it's something that has been done primarily in the Halbur brain, and it's a tool for segmentation and registration of EM stacks, in particular to, to be able to extract the synaptic clefts and uh, the shapes and features of the, of the, uh, the, the dendritic spines. And also, uh, BBPSDK, which is a C++ library, which was used to access the, the data that is being used to, to build the circuit and the simulation data that is produced in the BBP simulations. It's a library that is wrapped in Java and Python, and I'm, I won't talk more about, that, um, about it than this. So, when it comes to visualize the cortical column simulations, uh, from a visualization point of view, uh, the data sets have these characteristics. We have a hundred of different morphologies which have an average of uh, around 4,500 segments each one. And from these morphologies that Dan already talked uh, about how they are extracted in the laboratory, we can generate uh, a membrane mesh 
it's a triangular mesh and that uh, those meshes have on average uh, around 150,000 triangles on average I mean considering how many times its instance appears in the in the final circuit and regarding the simulation data uh, that is produced in a single in a one second simulation of the a 10k cortical circuit a uh, uh, memory voltage report at a tenth of millisecond of time step produces as much as 100 gigabytes which if not if it's not that much if you compare with uh, what HPC simulations are producing out there but you have to consider also that this is quite short simulation um, when we were first faced to visualize this data set we found out that uh, the visualization packages that are out there uh, like BTK, Amira, AVS do not provide features to directly visualize uh, the data set because it's quite domain specific so you have to either uh, use the scripting or the API capabilities uh, of these uh, softwares or you have to develop something on your own and that's the, the path that we took so RT Neurons is this application that was developed to do the post-mortem visualization of the simulations and the features that it has is that it provides high performance rendering of this particular data set with high quality uh, levels of detail, uh, different representations that depending on the distance at, we, at, at which you are seeing the neurons uh, use less geometrical complexity to, to show the, the data. It's domain specific. It has support for parallel rendering uh, using Equalizer, which is a library developed by Stefan Eilman. And with that, we can use this application in a cluster environment. So the scene is uh, split it up in pieces, or the screen is split it up in tiles. And then its node in the cluster renders a part of the data set, so to speed up the, the final rendering of the images. And it also supports alpha blending algorithms that uh, are different from what you can find in the computer graphics literature. Uh, alpha blending it's a complex uh, rendering problem in computer graphics because you have to, for all the pixels, for all the different pieces of geometry that fall in a single pixel, you have to sort them before you can do the composition of the transparency. So uh, that sorting operation is something that has to be done at the pixel level and becomes a uh, prohibitive if you want to do it for very complex uh, scenes and also still being able to do it in real time. It also has movie production capabilities so you can set up camera paths and, and set up the, the simulation playback at different rates and output uh, the images in order to make a movie for presentation. And I said that it's a standalone application, but it could also work as a, it can also work as a, as a library with a core by interface for remote control and, and customization of what's being displayed. So here, I won't enter into much detail about how these uh, levels of detail are rendered, but I wanted to, to show how they look like. For the SOMAS, we can use spheres, which are not tessellated spheres. That's an important feature. They are raycast spheres. So you only have to send to the graphics card a, a vector and a radius, and then it expands to a quadrilateral, and then it's raycasted. And it has this appearance of, a, of a, a sphere with a correct depth. And for the branches, we can use this thing that I call the cylinders, that are also things that it's a geometry that is partially computed in the GPU. You send to the GPU just the segment and the width of the of the, the, the branch, and then a quadrilateral is generated in the GPU, aligned to the screen, and shaded like that. So that reduces the, the geometrical complexity by a lot because you don't have to tessellate. So when you say it's done in the GPU, you, you, you just mean that these are done by OpenGL? You're not having to do any specific programming? No, it's OpenGL. Yeah, it's with GLSL, so it's completely standard. Would it work for WebGL in much the same way? For WebGL, um, I would say yes, but uh, WebGL, it's a different standard, so it might have constraints that uh, might not be possible to, to, might make not possible to use the renders that I'm using. But I'm not doing anything really fancy with regard to the features that are needed. So I think that with WebGL it will work. <coughs> because it's in the, in the shading language, not in the API part. So probably it will work. This is another level of detail. I choose about neuron here because it, it has this artifact here that, uh, that 
this branch should be wider here because for the part of the soma I'm using the mesh, the tessellated mesh and for the rest what I'm using here it's also geometry that is generated on the GPU. I'm sending as before uh, segments and width and this time instead of being uh, generated uh, a quadrilateral that is oriented to the screen this is uh, a conical frasto which has spherical caps so it actually has depth and it's recasted so uh, you generate something that it's like a, a bounding screen aligned geometry of the tubelet and then you recast the geometry to compute which is the final shading and if there is tubelet in that uh, point which you are recasting and these are the meshes that are generated by the algorithm that uh, Sebastian Lasserre developed so uh, I want to show also some videos to show how the visualizations look in action. This is a visualization of 1000 neurons. You can see here uh, the membrane voltage of the soma color coded depending on the hyperpolarization or polarization state. You can see here the same column, but instead of being rendered the membrane voltage, what time depicting it's the uh, the spiking state. So it's black if it's not spiking and white if the soma is spiking. And then here we have the same, but with some alpha blending applied. Here the alpha blending it's depending on the voltage value, and here it's depending on the on the spike state. And you can see how this visualization, this visualization looks like. It's pretty easy to see the activity of how the, the, the excitation state on the, on the column propagates in this kind of images. And here it's the same for... a mesocircuit comprised of... Uh, around 300,000 neurons if I remember correctly so this video plays back slowly because it was actually a structured real time this is not frames that were output and then a movie that was compressed this video was captured real time so this is the performance that you can expect for the recasting algorithm for spheres in a mm, not really high end but uh, a good graphics car nowadays Okay, this is a video because this is actually something that couldn't be done in real time with a full column, also with uh, voltage dependent transparency. With the SOMAS, the voltage dependent transparency works okay because uh, uh, there are less geometrical pieces that process, but with the, the full circuit, it becomes more complex. And this one was rendered offline. The thing here is that for the axon we are applying the same color value than for the soma and that's the reason for which you can see all this white here. So instead of trying to render the axon applying the same membrane voltage than, with the, than in the soma, we have an old visualization technique that what actually shows is how the spike propagates along the axon. Stop. Mm. Mm. Sorry for this. So this is only 100 uh, neurons, but you can see when, that when a neuron spikes, there is an action potential traveling uh, through the axon of that neuron.
Okay, so this is the current state. But uh, we have limitations with only this because so far we've been using this more like a rendering engine than a visual analysis tool, which should be the final uh, use case for, for this tool. And that means that mainly we've used it for uh, circuit debugging, for example, for debugging the, the circuit construction and finding uh, where the touches were being detected or where they should be visually, and also for public presentation. Uh, things that uh, should be improved, for example, in, in the quality and performance, we should provide better anti-alias and algorithms for some of the, of the representations, and better performance overall for the alpha render for the alpha blending. Corva has proven not to be a good choice to provide uh, a communication interface uh, for the application, so external GUI could be provided. And for those reasons, uh, we are currently under a refactorization of the application to wrap it in a Python library. So we are removing the core API and we are providing an API that will enable the users to uh, customize the visualization in a much more powerful way than how it's currently done. So the opportunities of this Python uh, wrapping are that we can have a high performance rendering engine with all the flexibility that Python provides. This will allow, as I was saying, faster insert customization of the visualization. Uh, so the output of the, the visualization can be tailored to the, the scientific question that the scientist is doing. That will also provide us the ability to leverage the, the 16 software for uh, graph plotting. For example, you could combine uh, the underlying library to access the data with VSDK and uh, rendering engine to select one neuron and then plot the membrane voltage in a matplotlib plot, for example. And also you can develop GUIs much, much faster using PyQt, for example. And that will also enable reusability of the code snippets that the user build for uh, different tasks between, between each other. So this is a mock-up of uh, how we would like this to look like. This is actually what the interface of the application that was using Corva to connect to RT Neuron looked like. But in the end, we want to do this with Python instead. So we'll have here a Python console, here the rendering, and you can select neurons and see here the, the voltage uh, plots, change the color map, and uh, have a special widgets to the simulation for the simulation playback. And do things like this also. This is an a, a image that I did hard coding the, the color maps in the, in the rendering engine itself, but it will be possible to do this uh, with little scripting. So what this is showing, it's a layer 5 pyramidal cell, the dendrites in red, and you have all the axons of all the neurons that are projecting to this neuron, and the color of the, the neuron shows which is the distance from the synaptic connection to the soma of the projected neuron. So deep blue means that the neuron is projecting close to the soma, and clearer and more transparent blue means that it's projecting to the apical dendrites, to the top of the apical dendrites, the, yeah, the apical dendrites. <coughs> so, uh, that's where we want RT neuron to go uh, in the short term uh, uh, direction, but we also want to uh, continue pushing it forward to uh, cope with the, the challenges that the VVP is facing in the short and long-term goals in the, in the modeling and simulation side. So in the modeling aspects, we want to deal with more geometrically realistic circuit reconstructions that implies having the spines and the buttons on the meshes and also moving to have unique uh, morphologies because in a, in a piece of tissue, you cannot be replicating the same neurons over and over. You have to have uh, unique models. And uh, we also want to uh, couple the rendering with the multi-scale simulations. So reaction diffusion simulations at the synapse level are also considered in the visualization. And on the computing aspects, uh, we want to uh, consider the how XXK computing challenges is going to challenges is going to affect the computer architectures of the future because that will have an impact on how the software technology and the tool chain for the analysis and visualization of the simulations has to be performed. Apart from uh, all the generic research, all the research that we want to continue carrying on in, in generic visualization strategies. So I have a question: Is this fine-tuned for uh, just for the BlueBrain project, or is it something that can be used for any data set? Mm, well, luckily, it's fine-tuned for for the BlueBrain. So the algorithms themselves, um, most of them are independent. 
For example, the algorithm for rendering the SOMAS, it's independent of the data. But the data access layer, it's relying on this BBP SDK library. So if, uh, if I want to say that I want to render a, a particular circuit, it's not using NeuroML or anything like that. So, you know, it's using the BBP SDK layer. But I see. So I was just looking for it. It's, it's, is it there on any of the repositories? It's not mm, public repositories, you mean? SourceForge, GitHub? No, it's not in a public repository. Is that the plan? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> So, um, in order to, to release as a public software, first we have to be able to, to support that. So we need manpower, uh, at least one more person, because it's only me so far, <laughs> doing the, the whole development of the, of the engine. And that's something that has to be discussed inside the project. Personally, I would like it to be open source at some point, but uh, that's a decision that uh, I cannot take because all the IP involved in the code, uh, I would say that it's really complex because it involves not only the BBP, but also involves my university and Cajalbu Brain. So that's something that would have to be cleared out first. And part of the reason for this is that there's something like an 80% overlap with the project that we've been doing, uh, which I mentioned very briefly in my talk. And we actually the GUI for Moose, you said. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So we tried, we tried to do due diligence and check that we weren't replicating somebody else's efforts. And it seems a shame that that has in fact happened anyway. Um, which is why it's nice to have these things out there, easily findable, and then one can uh, mm -hmm. do coordinated rather than parallel development. Yeah, I think there's also the Neuron Visio. Yeah, uh, Michele. Yeah, we, we check that out. And both those are sitting there on GitHub. Uh, both of them are freely available. And those people are speaking to each other, learning from each other, exchanging ideas. And both of those will, uh, and hopefully will, have, I mean, they, they have a similar requirements for loading in morphologies, loading in data sets. They're out there speaking. And hopefully we'll come up with a format for saving uh, morphology uh, um, uh, member of potential, whatever other uh, data in a common format, mm -hmm. which both of those can uh, view, maybe Neuroconstruct can save, or Neuron can save, they can visualize, and having your tool out there really available would mean that you can contribute that process as well, and mm -hmm. hopefully... Uh, yeah. Uh, that now that you mentioned uh, simulation output, I have a slide regarding that, because I think that that's something that could be standardized, because... Uh, process is there too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's all, yeah. Because uh, um, we've uh, another, another aspect in that domain, if we may enter the discussion already a little bit, but um, uh, when it comes to the uh, um, uh, hardcore rendering engines and such, uh, <laughs> there is also another domain where this is receiving a lot of interest out of the scientific domain, and that is gaming engines. Um, uh, and I know some people in the modeling community are looking into things like Blender or Panda 3D, which are uh, somewhat sophisticated tools in the Python world in that regard. Or in the, uh, at the more macroscopic imaging level, again, within science, there are libraries like Maya V. Have you ever heard of those? Have you ever looked into those? Do you see any connection points there? Yeah, I know, I know them. Uh, Maya V, I haven't used it myself. Blender, I use it. Um, I wouldn't say that Blender is, is, uh, targets the same kind of uh, rendering style that, uh, or rendering capabilities that uh, we were targeting with, uh, with RT Neuron. For Maya V, it could be the case, but still you have a domain-specific component that forces you to, to be able to program a part of the rendering itself. Uh, for example, all the mapping of simulation to, onto the, the meshes, you can do it in very different ways. Uh, you can apply a color per vertex, for example. That's something that any rendering engine can do. But if you want to be able to uh, do it fast, so the simulation uh, updates fast on the screen and you can have uh, interactive or even real-time playback, you have to do something which is more specific. You have to store the information on a, on a GPU buffer and then you have to refer the information with special indices from the, from the geometry. So it's something that is a bit ad hoc. And if you want to develop the level of digital te techniques that are specific also for, for neurons or also the view, view first some calling so you don't have to 
despite as much geometry as needed because it's not in view, that's something that is specific to, to this problem. So, yeah, continuing with this, uh, the implications that uh, we have for from the visualization perspective regarding multi-scale simulations is that uh, there are a lot of techniques that can be involved in doing a, a multi-scale simulation of tissue, uh, tissue level. We have uh, different techniques for uh, render for uh, simulation uh, of particles and molecules. We have the classical Hodgkin-Huxley, uh, different equations, even Navier Stokes. If you try to simulate the the flow of blood in the blood vessels, and also you can have derived data from the analysis, like the local field potentials, which uh, it's uh, different in nature uh, to the the ent entities that were simulated. That means that we have increased data, size, data sizes for, from all sides. We have, uh, as I said before, we will have unique cell geometries because if we want to go into a circuit level, we will need to have uh, unique geometries for the, for the cells. We also have more complex geometrical models. That means that we will have to refine our levels of detail. And we also have new simulation data sets. Mm, for example, the most obvious one, which is the molecular positions. Uh, so there is no one size fits all solution for visualization. We see that there is no single rendering engine that will be able to deal with uh, all the particularities of the different uh, rendering techniques that you have. For example, you have to be able to combine volume rendering with mesh rendering with particle rendering. And there are pieces of software that do that uh, independently. And probably for volume rendering, you don't want to replicate that effort. Uh, but you need to be able to integrate them in a single visualization in order to provide answers to questions, which is the final goal of this. <coughs> and regarding exascale computing, I don't know if you, uh, because I have the impression here that most of the people it's running the simulations on workstations or small clusters, but I think that exascale computing has an impact on, on where we are going because it will shape in some sense also the, the architectures, the computer architectures at the, not maybe necessarily at the consumer level because that's the mobile industry, but at the workstation and a small cluster level, it definitely will have an impact. So. The main thing that I want to stand out from this slide is that in order to achieve this exaflop uh, challenge and also keep the memory, the, the power uh, consumption constrained, <coughs> it seems that the goal, the, the, the way to go is to have compu computing cores that are going to be just slightly more powerful than now, but a lot more concurrency. While at the same time, the IO capacity is not going to grow that much. What is swim lane? Oops. Sorry? What is it? swim lane? Ah, swim lane. Yeah, sorry, I didn't explain that. It, uh, I took this uh, data from a scientific report from the Department of Energy in a workshop that was uh, celebrated last year, but they were referring back to another workshop from the Advanced Scientific Computing Research, uh, uh, a series of workshops that they organized. And what they uh, consider swim lanes are the two different choices that the hardware manufacturers are considering. We will have on one side uh, having more powerful cores, which is this one, and having less concurrency, well, less nodes in the end, or having uh, less powerful nodes but much more concurrency. In either case you can see that the total concurrency of the system uh, I don't know if this should be a key. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. The total concurrency of the system it's much higher than, than before. So that means that code, if you have a, a code that it's working fine on a computer and on our processor right now and you expect it to be to run much faster like four times faster in three years uh, you will be probably wrong unless you parallelize your code. So in the single core, the computing power is not going to grow that much. So that means that we have to go parallel, even if you are not going to run in an exascale, in a, in an exascale machine. So as I said, the, we're moving to massive parallelism, and that includes uh, uh, not only that we have many nodes that also inside a single node, you have much more cores, like for example, what Intel uh, has already, I think it's already a 
something that you can develop as a prototype, which is the Intel mics or the GPUs, uh, so to say also. Uh, in a supercomputer environment, we will have less memory per core. IO will be much more costly uh, than now, so there is a relative slowdown computing, uh, compared to the computing power. And also the power limits, the power limits, this is something important, will constrain data relocation. That means that instead of moving the data to where you want to process the data, it will be better to move the code that you want to run on the data to the data. In, in, in summary, regarding visualization, I, uh, it means that uh, we need to have a closer collaboration between the simulation and the analysis and visualization uh, communities. Because in situ processing, which is doing analysis and visualization in the same memory space than the simulation, will become much more important than it is right now. Some expectations are that the, by the time the exascale is here, 80% of the process will have to be done that way. But that's also an expectation from the, the community that it's doing visualization. So I don't know if that's going to see that that's going to look like that. Anyways, post-mortem is going to be uh, still important. So there's still room for defining standards to, uh, for uh, uh, simulation reports. So new techniques will have to be developed to, to cope with how the data sets are going to increase and also do an efficient management of the, of the I.O. And in the visualization community, it seems to be, uh, there seems to be a pretty common, it's accepted that the current technology is not going to scale to this scenario. So a software like VTK, Paraview and Visit won't be present at that scale because they have concurrency problems that need to be addressed. So this is not going to be a single team effort. And since we have more computational power, that means that we are also going to have more complex simulation data sets. A multi-scale simulation, it's a particular case of that. We have higher dimensionality. If you can, if you're running a stochastic code, probably you're interested in running a lot of simulations and then do analysis of the ensemble of the, the simulation results produced. So you have to develop new visualization techniques for that. So if we want to have uh, interoperability between tools, simulation engines, analysis and visualization frameworks, we have to specify uh, the entities that participate on simulations that are being performed. So that means that we need uh, ontologies and taxonomies and also APIs. Uh, for example, music, which I learned from it not on Thursday, web browsing on, on Wednesday was when I first learned from music, but it's the type of thing that we need to, in order to exchange data between the, the simulation and the analysis and visualization. And regarding post-mortem visualization, as I was saying, on purpose of what you were commenting, I think that it will be f uh, interesting to define uh, file formats or metadata standards also for simulation results. But considering that uh, uh, you need to have also certain capabilities for the uh, HPC simulations. So on the metadata side, you need mapping to the static data structures, so you can refer back uh, one particular position of an array of the simulation to the entity that produced that simulation value. But you also need to be able to uh, have a scalable way of write and read the file format that you define. And if possible, it should be also uh, good to have compressibility of the, of the data set. And for sure, what it's for me important is having a file format that it's random accessible and queryable in order to be able to provide query-driven visualization. And for that, I don't think that XML is the better choice for, for the final storage. So the hierarchy that you define in XML, it's OK. But then the, the file format itself, uh, it's not, it precludes random access. And it doesn't make the uh, visualization algorithms that require to query uh, data randomly at the user's request easy. <coughs> I think these issues are already being addressed by both of the applications you mentioned earlier um, already with a group which is actually related to the uh, ICF Google Summer Code project for uh, Python based API for most departmental modeling. So, I mean, if you're interested in doing that, I think give you details. But, I mean, all those issues are mm -hmm. being addressed by the moment. Also, uh, I think as Stephen Gerhardt 
is involved in that as well for use of HDF5 or uh, morphology in this context. But um, mm -hmm. this will link in as well to that simulation as well. So. Yeah, if you can send me the links later, I'd be interested to see it. So, well, I'm going to skip this slide because most of what of this content I already mentioned it. So we have to combine different rendering engines, different uh, entities, and also different plots that the user may want to to be able to see. And for that, we are mm, working on a prototype architecture. Uh, in order to deal with multiple view, multiple rendering engines, and runtime configuration, and it's based, it's very similar, uh, as you were saying, to to Mugli, 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 Mugli. When I saw it yesterday, I saw well, it's precisely what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so here you have the architecture. You have a C++ backend with the rendering engine, the parsers for the... It, I, I put HCF5 because that's what we use in, in BBP, but it could be any other uh, data format that you can imagine. The rendering engine sits on top of uh, OpenGL, and then you have Qt, a part which is in the C++ side, and another part which is in the Python side for the GUI. And there is a callback mechanism in order to... If you, pro if you perform an action on the rendering engine and that it's doing some selection, then have a callback that goes to the uh, user land, let's say, in order to trigger an action, like for example, mm, grab this data and plot the, the membrane voltage of this neuron. And I don't know if uh, what you did for Moogly, it's more or the same, but uh, we are targeting here to have multiple views, being able to have different rendering engines at the same time. So at some point, we would like to be able to show that you can do a VTK rendering and an OSG open scene graph rendering both in the same window and have matplotlib graphs on top and transparent. So, so far this is designed to be off screen rendering and it will be possible to do blending of the images of the different rendering engines if they are output into the to GPU buffers in the proper way. So, yeah, the conclusions. Currently, we are doing the rendering and visualization of these electrical simulations of the cortical columns with, uh, with RT neuron, but it's not sufficient as it is because we need better visual analysis of the result. We have to integrate multi scale simulation. Uh, of First of all, it will be the, the synapse molecular simulations that Daniel Keller is performing. And because of all the implications that relate to exascale computing. And the current work goes into these two converging lines, which is making a Python uh, library for RT neuron and writing a generic software architecture to easily prototype different visualization techniques. And at some point, we would like to make those converge and make the uh, uh, Python API for RT neuron being a plugin of the software architecture. And finally, I would like to acknowledge of uh, all the people that uh, it's uh, in some way or other involved in, in this work, uh, from the Cajal Blue Brain and uh, from the Blue Brain Project. And thanks, everybody. <coughs> <coughs>